Let's sing hallelujah to that as the children gather on the steps. Have you ever heard of such a thing as a treasure? You ever heard of that? Like in movies, any movie that you can think of where there's a treasure? Like what? The Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, they have treasure. And they have like treasure chests that kind of look like this maybe. And they have treasure inside. Lots of treasure. But you know what happens? I think sometimes when people get a treasure like this, you know what happens? This is what they do. I gotta hold on to this treasure. I gotta hold on to this treasure. I gotta, I gotta stay with it. Okay, I'm gonna, I gotta do something over here, but I don't want to leave it here. Ah, uh, okay. I'm just, just for a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it here. Oh no, I, I can't. I, I gotta hold on to it. I gotta hold on to it. This. And then, the other thing is, if. If I spend it, then I'm going to lose it, right? If I use this treasure, buy stuff, and then I'm going to lose it. So I better, I better just keep it all. I better just keep it. Treasure. Yeah, what's the use? You said it, Bobby. <laughs> you, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, well, the thing is, there's this, there's this kind of treasure that people get really careful and scared about and hold on to because they, they're afraid they'll lose it. If they give some away, they're going to lose it. But there's another kind of treasure that you can never lose. You know what it is? It's like God. God. God's a treasure. God's love is a treasure. God's love just like fills us up. Sort of like this, but not on the outside, but fills us up on the inside, God's love. And when we're filled with God's love, we can actually leave our chairs. <laughs> we can walk around. We can go places. We don't have to, we don't have to go and protect it because it's with us. This God's love is with us. And not only is it with us, but it, like, it empowers us. This love of God allows us to be kind and allows us to smile, allows us to help somebody. All of this. And you know what? When we give it away, you give lo God's love away, you get more of it. It doesn't disappear. You don't run out of it. You never go empty. So anyway, that's just a thought for you to think about that God is our treasure God's love is our treasure that we always have, always. It makes us rich. When I was a little kid, I asked my mom one time, are we rich? I had a feeling we weren't. <laughs> and she was ironing. She had to think about it for a minute. <laughs> what would she say to me? And she said, we're rich in our hearts. And that's kind of what that means, I think, to have God with us always and God's love. And in fact, the first song that we sang today, Be Now My Vision, the last verse of that song, I would like us all to sing again. If you look at your bulletins, everybody, it's the first song, the third verse. So, yeah, let me see if I've got my bulletin, too. Now, before you sing it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the words that you're going to be hearing. Okay, these are the words. Um, Riches I need not, nor life's empty praise. You, my inheritance, God, now and always. You and you only are first in my heart. Great God, my treasure, may we never part. And this is how it sounds. Riches I need not, nor life's empty praise. You, my inheritance, now and always. You and you only are first. 
fixed in my heart. Great God, my treasure, may we never part. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. So let's pray. That's a lot to remember, you know. <laughs> we could hold hands, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, you are our treasure. Uh, may we never part. And may you remind us that you're always filling our hearts with your love so that we can be kind and we can be joyful. We can help others. We can know that we are so rich. We're so rich with you. Help us to remember all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's let the adventure. Let us pray for inspiration. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in them the fire of your love. Amen. Well, if trust in God is basic to spiritual life, then no wonder spiritual guides like Jesus talk about money so much because when it comes to money printed with those words in god we trust in god we trust ironically that trust is often nowhere to be found <laughs> one way our lack of trust shows up is in thinking too much about money thinking too much. We worry that we're going to not have enough to live on, enough to pay the bills, enough to retire on. What if I get sick? What if I lose my job? What if this? What if that? What if? What if? What if? And in the midst of all this thinking, lots and lots of thinking about money, we seldom ever once think to ask God to help us let go of our fears and trust. Another way our lack of trust shows up is in not thinking about money. <laughs> not thinking about money. You know what I mean? Uh, not making a budget, not looking at your bank statements, not balancing your checkbook, something I have been guilty of my whole life. I have never balanced my checkbook. And in all this not thinking about money, we're just running from our fear instead of trusting that God can actually give us the wisdom and the clarity we need to manage our finances. There's another way we show our lack of trust when it comes to money, and that's in our spending. We really don't trust God to guide us in our spending. Either we spend all the time a lot, kind of compulsively, and try not to think about it, or, or we pinch our pennies and feel very guilty and anxious about spending. That's, that's how I feel usually. Even when I buy my clothes at a discount store, I still feel kind of guilty about making these purchases. How much did I buy? Did I really need this? <sighs> especially, when, especially when I have to throw out a brand new pair of shoes, as I just did recently, I bought it at a discount store because they fell apart. So I paid that little money and had to throw my shoes out. Hmm. Well, when we, don't, when we don't trust God in our money matters, then we let money control us. We sort of turn money into a God controlling us. And that is the message of today's passage from the book of Revelation. Revelation was written when 
there was a conflict between the values of the early church and the values of the Roman Empire. As Christians became more and more visible at the end of the first century, there was more and more pressure on them, and as for everybody in the Roman Empire, to worship the emperor Domitian. And more importantly, to worship the empire's values of power and wealth. Put your trust in power and wealth. Make, make those your gods. And John, the author of the book of Revelation, is crying out to the seven churches of Asia Minor, crying out, don't do that. Trust in God. Don't trust in money, the power you think that it brings you. And the wealthy people in this church that he's addressing today, Laodicea, they claim that they do trust God, but they also trust money. <laughs> Both. They trust God and they trust money. And John calls them on their compromising. And he says, you're lukewarm. God just wants to spit you out. Because <laughs> you, can't, you can't do both. You can't trust in God and money. You can't have some trust in God or a little trust in God any more than you can be a little pregnant. <laughs> just can't. Even, even if we only trust God in moments, those moments are moments of absolute surrender, at least in those moments. And I think we all have experienced at least those moments. And John says that those who do put their trust in money are self-deceived. They tell themselves that they're secure and safe and satisfied, they've got everything they need, they're all right. They tell themselves all these things, but beneath their complacent exterior, there's a lot of insecurity and fear because money can be taken away. You can lose it. Something can happen. Inside, they're fearful, and really they are empty, spiritually empty, spiritually poor, in poverty, they don't even know it. And John invites them to know their true wealth by opening the door of their heart to the Lord who's knocking, knocking at the door, wanting to, to show what real wealth is about, wanting to show what a real feast is about, abundance in our lives. Behold, I stand at the door. We know this passage really well, I think, some of us. Behold, I stand at the door. Only you can open it. Sometimes the best models for teaching us about trust with money, etc., are people who have very little money, like the widow in last week's gospel scene. But sometimes people with a lot of money <laughs> can show us the way. For example, there's a person I read about, I've been reading his books. His name is Ralph Dudera. He's a money manager. And in his book, The Wealth Conundrum, he describes his struggle with money. He's always had a struggle with money, having it control him, having it possess him, not, not being able to trust made him very tense in his life, his money problems. And in 1987, when the stock market crashed on Black Monday, Dudera was overwhelmed with anxiety, not because he lost any money. He didn't. He moved all of his money into money market accounts. That's not why he was bothered. This is, this is how he describes why he was bothered. It wasn't the money it was the loss of control. It was the fear. What if the financial system of the world went into shutdown? What if the money market mutual funds were not safe after all? 
And when I went home, I was suffering so much emotional burnout that I could hardly relate to my family. And I was certainly not being a good husband or father. Unfortunately, that wasn't that unusual. My attitude at home was ruled by the whims of the market. Even when I had a good day and made good money, I would still be upset and unreasonable with everyone. This money business was too much. I resolved to quit. So, at the ripe old age of 40, he decided to retire. He'd made a lot of money. And he thought, now I'll just let somebody else watch it. I'll have money market people or whoever watches money watch my treasure. I can be relieved. But something felt really wrong about that for him. Kind of have his treasure over there guarded so he wouldn't have to worry. It felt very wrong. And he prayed, as he often prayed, about clinging to money, about his fears. He prayed to God. And God spoke to his heart. God invited him to just turn control over this over to God. We hear about that all the time. Turn it over to God. Do it. And see yourself as just a manager of this money for my purposes. And he, he heard God say, just lay your fears, lay your insecurities, lay all of your struggles before me. Just lay them there. And let me transform you from the inside out. Well, that sounded pretty good to him, but you know how hard that is to do. <laughs> so he pondered it for a while. <laughs> and he decided, well, I, okay, I won't. I won't quit being a money manager. I'll continue that. But what I'll do is I will invest people's money and I will make a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money so that someday, someday I'll take that money and I will give it to charitable causes. That's what I'll do. I'll, 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 I'll try this out. Let God guide me, turn my worries over, make all this money. But apparently God would not leave him alone. <laughs> there was something else gnawing at him something else speaking within him. And he found himself taking a mission trip to work with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, helping desperately poor, dying people. You know, there, there's a house for the dying in Calcutta, for, and there's one for little children, infants. There's uh, a place for lepers in Calcutta. He worked with the dying and bathing them, helping them, etc. And this experience absolutely transformed him. He was so humbled. First of all, he was so humbled by the poverty that he saw and the suffering that he saw. He was humbled by Mother Teresa and her sisters how they really lived such simple, poor lives just so that people would know the love of God. And, and he was inspired by their love. So something kept moving within him, this inspiration, feeling so humbled and so inspired. And he realized what he ought to do is not keep money, not pile it up, not invest it for people and so that ultimately he could give it away, but he needed to give it away every year. 50% of his income, he needed to give it away every year to, to causes like this, Mother Teresa's work. And so that's what he started doing. He created a matching gift program for organizations that didn't just give a handout, but actually made a difference somehow, brought transformation in the world. That's what he did. Organizations like uh, Opportunity International that offers micro loans to very poor entrepreneurs in developing countries. So what in the world can we learn from a man like Dudera with all of his wealth? Because I don't think there's anybody in here, unless, unless you're 
keeping it very secret, who has such wealth. He's a multi-multi-whatever millionaire. What can we learn from that? We don't have that kind of money. Well, first of all, what we can learn is to pay attention to our struggle with trust. Pay attention to it. We struggle with it. We really, really do. I know I do. To honestly acknowledge that struggle before God. Lay it before God and ask God to change us. Sort of the way people who, are, who have some kind of addiction admit their helplessness. That's the spirituality of 12-step, right? Admit your helplessness and, and put yourself in the hands of God. Second thing we can do is learn to look at our money in a clear-headed way. Really read our bank statements. <laughs> How much do we have exactly? Where is it exactly? Think about it in, in good, clear-headed ways. Make a budget with God's help. And, and begin to see ourselves as managers of whatever we have for God's purposes. We are managers of this so that we learn to use money well and not let it use us. And finally, we can find ways to help the world with our money. We can come up with some kind of cr our own criteria for giving. Uh, Dudera gives to the church because he believes the church is in the business of teaching people how to trust. He also gives to the organizations like the kind I described, who don't just give handouts, but somehow teach, somehow transform, uh, transform the way that Mother Teresa's sisters transformed him. He worked with them. They transformed him, helped him to see in a different way, gave him a new perspective on, on what he had and what he had to give and what he should do. Behold, I stand at the door, God says. Will you open it? You know, this scene from the book of Revelation today reminds me of the scene of Ebenezer Scrooge's cold, cold house with Jacob Marley knocking at the door, knocking at the door. Ebenezer Scrooge is so much like these rich people in the church of Laodicea who's turned his money into a god. This is how Dickens describes him. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, coveting old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret. Self-contained. and Solitary as an oyster. Hmm. But we know what happens to Ebenezer when he finally opens the door. The door to his heart. This small life of his, this cold, grasping, fearful, isolated, lonely life of his is transformed. And at the end of the story, he joins a lavish feast hosted by his nephew Fred, whom he's cut off from his life. And that feast is exactly like the feast being described in today's passage from the book of Revelation. This feast of joy and abundance. So does that feast sound good to you? <laughs> do, you do you long, do you long to be transformed have God transform whatever lack of trust you have, the struggles that you have, 
the lack of clarity you have about money, the anxiety or worries, how whether you hold on to it or whether you spend it too much or whether you look at your bank statements or you never look at your bank statements, and you feel that you are just being controlled by it. Are, are you longing for freedom, the kind of freedom I was describing to young people, to being able to walk around, to be able to give of yourself, to be able to trust, to be able to celebrate with this great, great, great abundance that we have. If that sounds good to you, then please say amen.